Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We begin in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. My respected elders, my dearest youngsters, brothers and sisters in Iman. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our admins have also requested us to address the false accusation that was made against us by some of the Ahlul Mimbar with regard to a claim that was presented in part of a lecture that was uh, circulated concerning the Mahdi in Sunni sources. So what was being presented was actually a summary of the rejection disputes. So as far as the question of the Mahdi is concerned, the concept exists on both sides of the, of the divide in as far as the narrations are concerned. You have narrations in Shia books of Hadith, you have narrations in Sunni books of Hadith. And on both sides of the divide, you have scholars who have studied these narrations. And then you have two camps. You have one camp which authenticates this narr these narrations. And on the basis of this authentication, it regards the claim and the belief about the Mahdi to be a valid one. But on the other hand, on both sides of the divide, on the Shia side as well as the Sunni side, you've had scholars and experts of hadith who have studied the narrations about this particular topic and they have discredited them. They have found weaknesses in their chains, problems, flaws, because of which they conclude that these narrations are not authentic and they dismiss them and discredit them. Now, to cover both in one single lecture is not possible. So we will first address the claim about the Sunni sources. So first of all, what has to be clarified here is that unfortunately the speaker who issued these statements and made these false accusations against us probably ended up making a fool of himself in the process because he did not even understand where the statement is coming from. He just heard a fragment of a longer series of discourses on this issue. And he didn't even know what we were doing in that, in that particular uh, segment. So he assumed that these are our arguments. And then he tried to uh, attribute them to us. And then he attempted to discredit them. And then to claim that we are promoting flagrant lies. These are blatant lies. And that therefore the one presenting them is a liar. And I think this kind of... Uh, comedic episode uh, reminds us of the importance of acting on guidelines Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the Quran with regard to rumors and things that are circulated. In Surah An-Nisa, Surah number 4, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes a section of the people in Medina, particularly the munafiqeen. He says, وَإِذَا جَاءَهُمْ أَمْرٌ مِّنَ الْأَمْنِ أَوِ الْخَوْفِ أَذَاعُوا بِهِ وَلَوْ رَدُّوهُ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ وَإِلَىٰ أُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْهُمْ لَا عَلِمَهُ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَنْبِطُونَهُ مِنْهُمْ وَلَوْ لَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ لَاتَّبَعْتُمُ الشَّيْطَانَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when any news about peace or any uh, dreadful or threatening event إِذَا جَاءَهُمْ أَمْرٌ مِّنَ الْأَمْنِ أَوِ الْخَوْفِيَ Any matter of peace and security or any matter of that is worthy of being feared, like war or, you know, some enemy movements or something like that. When any news is brought to them of that, they immediately circulate it and they spread it. Allah says this is not the way to go. If instead of that, you were to bring this matter in confidence to the authorities concerned, which in the state of Medina is the Holy Prophet, and the Holy Prophet had officers who used to deal with this kind of stuff. So Allah is saying if instead of uh, going to the public with this and circulating this in the public, if you were to actually go to the Holy Prophet and the Ulul Amr, there are of officials who have been designated for this task, for investigating these kinds of reports. The Holy Prophet has an intelligence division, people who specialize in this. So Allah says, if you were to bring the, this kind of data and information to the people who are actually 
uh, designated <clears throat> with the task of dealing with these kinds of rumors or intelligence. Uh, then basically the, the people who are tasked with this responsibility would be able to figure out whether it is trustworthy, whether it is not, and what is to be done about it. And then Allah says, وَلَوْلَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ لَتَّبَعْتُمُ الشَّيْطَانَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Had it not been for the bounty and fadl of Allah and His mercy on you, you would end up, most of you would uh, follow shaitan, except for a few. Similarly, in Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah number 49 of the Qur'an, verse number 6, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another, uh, issues another appeal to the believers. He says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِالنَّبَئٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا أَنْ تُصِيبُوا قَوْمًا بِجَهَالَةٍ فَتُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who believe, whenever a fasiq comes to you with a piece of news or information, then فَتَبَيَّنُوا Don't just accept it at face value, rather تَبَيَّنُوا Investigate, probe, don't just close your eyes and tr blindly trust uh, what is being said. And Allah says, if you don't follow this advice, you know what's going to happen? And تُصِيبُوا قَوْمًا بِجَهَالَةٍ فَتُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ Because if you don't follow this, if you're not, uh, if you don't have an analytical investigative approach, you just blindly accept whatever is shared with you, the result of that is going to be and تُصِيبُوا قَوْمًا بِجَهَالَةٍ You're going to end up wronging people out of your ignorance. فَتُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ And obviously later on when you find out, you're going to become extremely regretful. You will bite your fingers in regret at how you made a fool out of yourself by trusting unverified reports that you were not supposed to rely on and trust. So this is advice not just for the speakers but also for the audience. Because you might say, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if a fasiq brings you this news. Well, if you go by Ayatollah, Sheikh Muhammad Asif Muhsini's uh, explanation that he gives in the Muqaddimah of Mashra'atu Bihar al-Anwar, he talks about how those Ahlul Mimbar who narrate narrations which are da'if, which are weak, or which have signs of fabrication on them, or which are not known to be from the Ahlul Bayt salam, with certainty, and then they attribute them to the Ahlul Bayt, and on the back of these narrations they make tall claims about Allah, which contradict the Qur'an and the established guidance of Ahlul Bayt, and they thereby end up promoting ghulu, which is condemned by the Qur'an and Ahlul Bayt. He says such people are doing iftira against Allah, and iftira against Allah is the biggest fisq. So yes, definitely, anyone who shares fabricated narrations or lies against the Ahlul Bayt from the member definitely fits the definition of a fasiq and therefore additional precautions are supposed to be taken with such people and such uh, speakers themselves should take these precautions in order to avoid making a fool out of themselves so in this case what happens is he listens to a part or a segment of the presentation in which a summary of the rejectionist position is being given and as part of that summary, obviously, you also have to mention one of the reasons or one of the prominent conspicuous arguments that the rejectors of the concept of Mahdi on the Sunni side. So when we mention Bukhari and Muslim and the argument based on Bukhari and Muslim, this is not a Shia argument because ultimately Bukhari and Muslim are not Shia books. So the Shia don't care about this. The argument that's being made is by Sunni revivalists and revisionist scholars who reject the concept of the Mahdi and one of the arguments, one of the many arguments that they bring, in fact one of the first arguments that they bring often is the claim that if the Mahdi is a really established concept and that there were mutawatir or numerous narrations about it, then how come Al-Bukhari and Muslim have failed to record even one narration in which the Mahdi is mentioned. So this is not even m my claim <laughs> because think about it as far as our methodology and as far as our approach is concerned I mean go and listen to our series of lectures that we've given against Ghulu, against all of these practices. All of those narrations from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt that we've been narrating and sharing with the public to warn them 
against the consequences of accepting ghulu and accepting or performing shirk. All of those narrations that we've presented from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, have Bukhari and Muslim narrated them? Bukhari and Muslim have not narrated even one of those narrations. So, if we were of the belief that Bukhari and Muslim not narrating a certain narration discredits it completely, then what about all of those narrations that we've been presenting? Those would also get discredited. So if this speaker had used even a little bit aql, and if he had even bothered to listen what we've been saying instead of relying on rumors and what people are feeding, whether it's two sources, one of them is not even Khoja or one of the... Baba, instead of listening to third parties, if one were to actually bother to listen to the person that you want to refute, you would end up making, yeah, the likelihood of you making a fool of yourself would be much lower and lesser. But unfortunately, when you rely on tertiary and secondary sources and you don't listen to the primary source, this is what happens. You end up making assumptions about people and about their beliefs or about what their position is when you don't even know it. So this claim that was presented in the summary. This is not our claim. It is the claim of the top level Sunni scholars of Hadith who reject the concept of the Mahdi on this grounds. And we don't speak anything without references and without dalil and proof. So let me start giving you the references. You can check, for example, the first reference that you can check is Tafsirul Manar. Tafsirul Manar in 12 volumes based on the lectures of uh, Al-Ustad, Al-Imam, Al-Allama, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, one of the greatest scholars of Al-Azhar in the modern period. His student, Al-Allama, Al-Sayyid Muhammad Rashid Rida Al-Husayni, he collected his lectures, he improved upon them, and he published a whole tafsir, a tafsir of Quran uh, that goes up to the 12th volume. It is not a complete tafsir. Uh, but in 12 volumes, until his death, he kept on writing this tafsir. And in this tafsir, in volume 9, when he comes to the section about the Mahdi, he has a heading, which is At-Ta'arud wal-Ishkalat fi Ahadith al-Mahdi. This is volume 9 of Tafsir al-Manar, page 499. You can check it. This is Darul al-Manar, the 1367 Hijri edition. Look at what he writes. He's a great Sunni Salafi scholar. وَأَمَّا التَّعَارُضْ فِي أَحَادِيثِ الْمَهْدِيِّ So now he's talking about the Ahadith of Mahdi. He says, وَأَمَّا التَّعَارُضْ فِي أَحَادِيثِ الْمَهْدِيِّ فَهُوَ أَقْوَى وَأَظْهَرُ وَالْجَمْعُ بَيْنَ الْرِوَايَاتِ فِيهِ أَعْسَرُ وَالْمُنْكِرُونَ لَهَا أَكْثَرُ وَالشُّبْهَةُ فِيهَا أَظْهَرُ وَلِذَلِكَ لَمْ يَعْتَدَّ الشَّيْخَانِ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ رِوَايَاتِهَا فِي صَحِيحَيْهِمَا Al-Allama al-Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida al husseini This is what he writes. He says, as far as the ahadith of Mahdi are concerned, as far as the contradiction in the ahadith of Mahdi is concerned, فَهُوَ أَقْوَى That it is the strongest. azhar, And it is very visible. It is very apparent and conspicuous. So you see, he's one of those Sunni scholars who reject the whole concept of the Mahdi. They say, there is no Mahdi. So what do you do about riwayat in your books, Mawlana, Shaykhana? He says, no, 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 those riwayat are not hujja upon us because they are mutually contradictory. They are self-contradictory. This is his position. Huh? He says, and the co contradictions in those reports are aqwa, they're very strong, and azhar. <clears throat> they are very apparent. They are most conspicuous. Well, jama'u bayna riwayati fihi ahsar. And to reconcile those contradictions and those contradictory narrations is extremely difficult. And he says, if you look at the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah, who reject it, who reject those narrations and who discredit and weaken those narrations, their number is greater. So yes, there are scholars among the Ahlul Sunnah who authenticate those narrations. But Sheikh Rashid Rida is saying the number of those who reject it is greater. وَالشُّبْهَةُ فِيهَا أَظْهَرُ And the doubt in it, in these narrations, is also more apparent. And then look at the last line here. وَلِذَلِكَ لَمْ يَعْتَدَّ الشَّيْخَانِ 
بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ رِوَايَاتِهَا فِي صَحِيْحَيْهِمَا And it is for this reason that the shaykhan, and a shaykhan in Sunni terminology refers to a shaykh al-Bukhari and a shaykh Muslim. He says that is why the shaykhan, Bukhari and Muslim have not relied and they have not uh, brought out any of the narrations about the Mahdi that mention him in their Sahihain. So this is the claim of Al-Allama al-Shaykh Muhammad Rashid Rida al-Husayni in his Tafsir al-Manar. You can see he gives a number of reasons for rejecting the Ahadith about Mahdi and he also cites this reason that Al-Bukhari and Muslim have not brought any narration that mentions the Mahdi. This is the first source that you can check. Then after him, Ahmad Amin. Ahmad Amin is also a rejecter of the concept of the Mahdi. In his book, Duha al-Islam, if you go to see volume 3 uh, of Duha al-Islam, page 237. This is the 7th edition, Maktabatul al nahd al-Misriya, page 237. This is what he writes. He says, Wazad al-Qawlu bil-Mahdi. He describes the development of the Mahdi theory in the Sunni circles. He says, the uh, belief in the Mahdi after the ahadith about it, which he claims were invented, the, uh, the, the, the belief started to grow. And he says it also spread among the Shia. And numerous narrations were fabricated to support it. وَلَمْ يَرْوِ الْبُخَارِ وَمُسْلِمْ مِنْ أَحَادِيثِ الْمَهْدِي مِمَّا يَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ عَدَمِ صِحَّتِهَا شَيْءٍ أَوْ مِمَّا يَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ عَدَمِ صِحَّتِ صِحَّتِهَا عِنْدَهُمَا He says, And Al-Bukhari and Muslim did not narrate from the ahadith of Al-Mahdi anything. And this proves that as per Imam Muslim and Imam Bukhari, the narrations about the Mahdi are, are also not authentic. Um, some uh, researchers would also add that in Imam al-Bukhari, it is not that he was not aware about these narrations. In his uh, Tariq al-Kabir, he mentions a narration in which the Mahdi is explicitly mentioned, but then after mentioning it, he says, وَفِي إِسْنَادِهِ نَظَرْ He discredits it because Al-Bukhari saying وَفِي إِسْنَادِهِ نَظَرْ is taken to be one of the greatest uh, statements of discrediting, a very strict and strong statement discrediting a hadith as far as the terminology of Al-Bukhari is concerned. So Ahmad Amin also, you notice he's saying that وَلَمْ يَرْوِ الْبُخَارِ وَمُسْلِمْ مِنْ أَحَادِيثِ الْمَهْدِي مِمَّا يَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ عَدَمِ صِحَّتِهَا عِنْدَهُمَا أَوَّلَمْ يَرْوِ الْبُخَارِ وَمُسْلِمْ شَيْئًا مِنْ أَحَادِيثِ الْمَهْدِيِّ مِمَّا يَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ عَدَمِ صِحَّتِهَا عِنْدَهُمَا And Bukhari and Muslim have not narrated, he claims, they have not narrated any hadith about, uh, among the hadith of the Mahdi. And this, he says, مِمَّا يَدُلُّ This is one of the proofs that the narrations about the Mahdi are not authentic, they are not reliable. And then he continues, he says, وَإِنَّمَا ذَكَرَهَا التِّرْمِذِيُّ وَأَبُو دَاوُدُ وَأَبْلُ مَاجَ Rather, the narrations about the Mahdi have been mentioned by At-Tirmidhi and Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah and these others. And we will see what the scholars also say about this. So this is the second statement, the second source, independent source that you can quote for this. He's another rejectionist scholar as far as the Mahdi is concerned. And he is citing the lack of appearance and Bukhari and Muslim not mentioning any of the hadith of Mahdi in there. Uh, in their Sahih compilations. Then you have a third source that we can give you and that is the book Al-Mahdiya Fil-Islam Mundu Aqdam Al-Usur Hatta Al-Yawm Dirasa Wafiya Li Tariqiha Al-Aqadi Wa Siyasi Wa Al-Adabi It's a book uh, about the concept of Mahdism in Islam from the earliest period until today. It is a comprehensive study of the history of this a belief from the ideological point of view, from the political point of view, and from a literary point of view. It is written by Al-Allama Sheikh Sa'ad Muhammad uh, Hassan, who is among the ulama of Al-Azhar. 
So and this is the first edition, uh, which was published in 1953, 1373 Hijriya by Dar al-Kitab al-Arabi in Egypt. He writes uh, in this book, he says, وَأَمْثَالُ هَذِهِ الْأَحَادِيثِ This is pages 69 to uh, 70. وَأَمْثَالُ هَذِهِ الْأَحَادِيثِ لَمْ تَرْوِهَا الْكُتُبُ الصَّحِيحَةُ الْمُتَشَدِّدَةُ فِي الْرِوَايَةِ After mentioning some of the narrations about the Mahdi, you know, the narrations in which it is said that even if one day is left before Yawm Al-Qiyamah and there will be a person from my Ahlul Bayt whose name will be my name and all of that, he says, وَأَمْثَالُ هَذِهِ الْأَحَادِيثِ لَمْ تَرْوِهَا الْكُتُبُ الصَّحِيحَةُ الْمُتَشَدِّدَةُ فِي الْرِوَايَةِ he says these kinds of narrations have not appeared in the authentic books of the Ahlul Sunnah, which are al mutashaddida fi riwaya, which are strict in as far as narrations are concerned. So he's saying these narrations have been mentioned in books that are lax, that are not very strict. But as far as the authentic books are concerned, he says it's not mentioned in them. Kasahihail Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail, wa Muslim ibn al Hajjaj, and Naysabudi. He says, what are the strict books that we are talking about in which this narration is not mentioned or these narrations are not mentioned? He says, like Sahih al-Bukhari by Muhammad ibn Ismail and Sahih of Imam Muslim bin al-Hajjaj al-Naysaburi وَإِنَّمَا رَوَتْهَا الْكُتُبُ الْأَقَلُّ تَشَدُّدًا Rather, the narrations about the Mahdi have been transmitted and reported in books which are not very strict. كَسُنَنِي أَبِي دَاوُودُ وَابْنِ مَاجَ وَالْتِرْمِذِي وَالنَّسَائِي وَمُسْلَدْ أَحْمَدْ such as these books which he has just mentioned. وَلَقَدْ أَوْسَى عُلَمَاءُ الْحَدِيثِ وَنَقَدَتُهُ هَذِهِ الْمَجْمُوعَةَ نَقْدًا وَتَفْنِيدًا And he says the ulama of hadith and the critics and experts of hadith have written long pages discrediting and weakening and critiquing these narrations which are found in those other books. وَرَفَضَهَا uh, الْعَلَّامَةُ إِبْنُ خَلْدُونَ فِي مُقَدِّمَتِهِ He also cites the example of Allama Abdul Rahman ibn Khaldun, who rejects or discredits and weakens the narrations about the Mahdi in his Muqaddimah. Although Allama ibn Khaldun, he says, yes, the reports about this are weak, uh, but he does not uh, completely rule out the possibility. He says that if it does happen, he says it's highly unlikely in light of the status, the Rijali status of these narrations. But if someone still insists, then he says, okay, he tries to give a natural explanation for how a Mahdi, uh, if we take these narrations to be uh, authentic, of how it would uh, uh, turn out. So he tries to offer a natural explanation. But as far as the narrations are concerned, even Ibn Khaldun says that they cannot be relied upon. So this is a third source. And then uh, we have uh, another fourth source, which is actually a very important uh, study on, on the Mahdi, Al-Mahdi al muntaza that has been done by one of the most uh, noteworthy professors of Hadith criticism and applied Hadith studies. Ilm al-Hadith al-Naqdi wa tatbiqi He's one of the most distinguished uh, experts in this field. He's actually authored a whole book. It's in around over 550 pages. A, a complete uh, study on this topic. It is called Al Mahdi al Muntadar fi Riwayati Ahli Sunnah wa Shia al Imamiya. Dirasatun Hadithiyatun Naqdiya. Okay, the title of the book is The Awaited Mahdi, a critical study of Sunni and Shia transmissions. This is by Al Ustad al Dr. Al Allama al Sheikh al Sayyid, he's also a Sayyid, Adab Mahmoud al Hamsh, Al Husseini al Radawi. So in this book, you notice uh, on uh, page 106, he also mentions the same thing when he's critiquing a claim by Sheikh Mughniya. He says, مَا ذَكَرَهُ الشَّيْخْ مُغْنِيَ مِنْ أَنَّ جَامِعَ التِّرْمِذِي وَسُنَنْ أَبِي دَاوُودُ وَبِنْ مَاجَ مِنَ الصِّحَاحِ عِنْدَ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ فَغَيْرُ صَحِيحِ So Sheikh Mughniya, he tries to say that the Mahdi is mentioned in the Sahih and authentic books of the Ahlul Sunnah. And then he mentions... Examples of these authentic books, he says, for example, Sunan Abi Dawood, Wabin Maja, these are all, or Jami at Tirmidhi. He claims these are among the Sihah of Ahlul Sunnah. And uh, Al Allama Sheikh uh, Adab Mahmud Al Hamsh, he says, Fagayru Sahih, he says, this claim is incorrect. 
The experts of hadith don't accept this claim. Why? He says, فَالصِّحَاحُ عِنْدَ مُحَقِّقِ أَهْلِ السُّنَّةِ صِحَاحُ الْبُخَارِ وَمُسْلِمْ وَابْنِ حِبَّانِ وَابْنِ الْخُزَيْمَةِ فَقَطْ He says, uh, as far as the muhaqqiqin, the, the, the experts among the scholars of hadith among the Ahl sunnah as far as they are concerned, the sihah, the most authentic and authoritative books of hadith, are only four. They are Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sahih of Ibn Hibban, and Sahih of Ibn Khuzayma. Some might add Sahih of Hammam ibn Munab, uh, Munabih, but that is not, uh, you know, Mawdi' Ittifaq among everyone. So Khair, he mentions these uh, these four, and he says these four only, فقط. وَلَمْ يَقْبَلْ عُلَمَاءَ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ إِلَّا مَا فِي صَحِحَيْ الْبُخَارِ وَمُسْلِمْ دُونَ بَحْثٍ وَتَفْتِيشٍ غَالِبًا He says if there are two books which the scholars of Ahl Sunnah, they accept narrations from them without too much research and scrutiny, it is Bukhari and Muslim, for the most part. He's saying for the most part because Al-Albani and Ibn Al-Jawzi and others, there are few narrations from Bukhari and Muslim that they have also critiqued, but generally speaking, if there is any book among the books of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'a, which they don't scrutinize that much, if they get a hadith from it, it's Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Otherwise, he says, even Sahih of Ibn Hibban and Ibn Khuzayma tahtaju indahum ila bahthin wa naqt. Even a hadith being in Sahih of Ibn Hibban and Ibn Khuzayma is not enough. They, they require research and scrutiny. وَلَيْسَ فِي الصَّحِيحَ الْبُخَارِ Now look at this uh, scholar, this is his statement. Al-Sheikh Adab Mahmoud Al-Hamsh. He has authored a 554-page or 553-page study of the Mahdi al-Muntavar. He says, وَلَيْسَ فِي صَحِيحَيِ الْبُخَارِ وَمُسْلِمْ أَيُّ حَدِيثٍ يُصَرِّحُ بِذِكْرِ الْمَهْدِي And he says, there is not, there does not exist in both Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. There does not exist in these two books even one single hadith يُصَرِّحُ بِذِكْرِ الْمَهْدِي which explicitly mentions the Mahdi. فَإِنْ كَانَ الشَّيْخْ مُغْنِيَ لَا يَدْرِي هَذَا فِي إِصْطِلَاحِ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ So if Sheikh Mughniya is not familiar with the terminology of the Ahl sunnah and their conventions as far as Ilm al-Hadith is concerned فَكَانَ عَلَيْهِ التَّثَبُّتْ then he should have investigated, he should have studied and researched what the Ahlul Sunnah say about their books. المصادر, he should have consulted the sources instead of just coming forward and making the claim that just because it's found in Ibn Majah and you know Tirmidhi and Sunan Abi Dawood, therefore it is found in authoritative Sunni books. This expert of hadith says no, it's not as simple as that. Sunan Abi Dawood, for example, in which you have explicit mention of the Mahdi. He says this book of hadith is not accepted in its totality. That's why you find Albani, Mawlana, he writes a whole book, Sahih Sunan Abi Dawood and Da'if Sunan Abi Dawood. He divides it into two parts. This is a book in which he collects the Sahih narrations, there's another book in which he collects the Da'if narrations, and even his Tasheeh and Tad'if is not Mawda Ittifaq, it's just basically his research. Other scholars have other things to say about that. So, and then he says, والمهم أن وجود الحديث في أي كتاب من كتب أهل السنة المعتمدة لا يعني صحته وصلاحيته للاحتجاج عندهم. He says, so that's why the existence of a hadith in a book from among the books of أهل السنة is not sufficient to indicate that it's authentic or that you can base any claim on it, that you can actually prove something from it. إِلَّا إِذَا كَانَ فِي صَحِيحِ الْبُخَارِ Unless it is in Sahih al-Bukhari أو صحيح مسلم فقط Or if it is in Sahih Muslim وَوُجُودُهُ فِي غَيْرِهِمَا يَدُلُّ عَلَى حَاجَتِهِ إِلَى الدَّرْسِ وَالنَّقْتِ If it is not found in these two and it is found in others then we have to investigate and scrutinize and check the chains. وَمَا قَالَهُ عَنْ ضَرُورَةِ الْإِيمَانِ بِالْمَهْدِيِّ تَفْرِيعًا عَلَى ذَلِكْ يُصْبِحْ مَحَلَّ نَظَرْ أيضا لأنه لم يأتي عن النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم حديث واحد صحيح صريح في المهدي كما سيأتي تحريره في فصول تخريج الأحاديث ونقدها And that's why he says the conclusion of Sheikh Mughniya that on the basis of such narrations it is important to believe in the Mahdi he says this claim itself becomes محل نظر it becomes problematic because 
we have not received any hadith from and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we've not received even one hadith, he says, which is both sahih, authentic, and sarih, explicit in its mention of the Mahdi. So I hope now you understand what is going on here. Now you might ask <coughs> Sayyidina, so then explain to us what was the speaker doing? If some of the greatest scholars and experts who have studied the concept of Mah Mahdi in depth in Sunni narrations, they are constantly repeating this argument. So I hope now you understand why it was presented in our summary. When we were summarizing the rejectionist position, we have to refer to this argument because it is mentioned, even if we don't accept it. But this is one of the reasons, one of the arguments that has to be presented because so many scholars are making it and they're using it as an excuse, as a pretext to reject the ahadith about the Mahdi. So obviously, you have to give it consideration. And it's not like this argument has not been responded to. It has been responded to, but the response of this particular speaker, who tries to accuse us of being promoters of blatant lies, of flagrant lies, or he tries to say that we are lying. So this is the first uh, rebuttal and the first response to him is that number one, we are not the ones saying it. Okay, our methodology, if you knew the ABC of our methodology, you would know that we are not people who argue like this. Majority of the narrations we present are not there in Sahih al-Bukhari from Ahlul Bayt. The narrations that we present, they're not found in Sahih al-Bukhari. So what if a narration is not found in Sahih al-Bukhari Muslim? But the problem is he doesn't know. As Allah says in the Quran, بَلْ كَذَّبُوا بِمَا لَمْ يُحِيطُوا بِعِلْمِ They have declared something to be a lie when they have not even encompassed it. You've not even encompassed our approach. You've not even un understood our metholo methodology. And then you are taking instances of places where we are presenting a summary of other people's views. Now you say, but Sayyidina, you did not mention all these references in that summary. You say, yeah, it is a summary. In the main uh, discourses, we mention all the, all the sources and all the references and all the page numbers and volume numbers, but when we are summarizing, because we've already established this uh, beforehand, we don't have to mention everything again. But the first lie that he presents with full authority from the member is that he says he is rejecting. He is saying that Bukhari and Muslim have not mentioned it. Whereas I think now it is clear to you, it's not us. We are simply referring to and pointing to the argument of these scholars of the Ahlul Sunnah who are rejecting the hadith of Mahdi because they have not appeared in Bukhari and Muslim. So the first stage at which this speaker unfortunately lied to the public from the member is when he attributed this to us. Okay. I will say, but Bicharo, he heard that recording, he thought it was you, say, but that is why the Quran says, فتبين, investigate first, find out, is this really your view before I end up making a fool of myself, refuting a view that's not even of the person that I'm trying to refute, first investigate. Otherwise, you end up making a fool of yourself. So that's the first lie that he presents, that we are making this claim. The second lie is his claim that this claim is false. The claim that these great uh, scholars of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, such as al uh, Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida and uh, al Ustad Ahmad Amin, and for example, a Sheikh, uh, a Sheikh. Uh, Sa'ad Muhammad Hassan, the scholar from Al-Azhar, or for example, Sheikh Haddad Mahmoud Al-Hamsh. All of these great scholars and experts of Hadith, the claim that they are making, he says, is false. It's a lie. And then what does he do to prove that it is a lie? He brings a Hadith. Well, first of all, let me mention the, the really funny part. So he says, no, this is actually a lie. In Sahih Al-Bukhari, we actually have a hadith According that mentions media, the Mahdi. Okay, we have a hadith that mentions the Mahdi. This is his claim. So, to prove his claim, he actually then presents a web page. And the web page, we have it with us. It's right here. It's called Al Mahdi al Muntazar. There is an article on this page. It's called Al Mahdi al Muntazar fi Sahih al Bukhari. Al Mahdi al Muntazar in Sahih al Bukhari. So even we were in, 
interested and intrigued because this is an interesting claim. He's, there's an article about the Mahdi al-Muntazar in Sahih al-Bukhari. He presents it from the Mimbara and he says this is the, the proof. There is a whole article on the internet where which is entitled Al-Mahdi al-Muntazar in Sahih al-Bukhari. The interesting thing is, and I will ask the admins, okay, to give you the link for this article in the description so that at least those of you who understand Arabic, if you don't understand Arabic, go to someone who understands Arabic, show him this web page. You will see, Allah, these, the, the level of duplicity and the level of <laughs> dishonesty and what should I say? Ignorance. They don't even check what they present. I mean, this Bicharo, he did not even bother to read this, this article. So the interesting thing is, this is a misleading title. Al-Mahdi al-Muntazar fi Sahih al-Bukhari. The interesting thing about this article it, is it, it mentions no hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari. From beginning to end, you can see it starts by talking about the concept of Al-Mahdi al-Muntazar, about how the Holy Prophet, there are hadith attributed to him, and then he talks about the hadith of Mahdi, and then he comes to the main heading, Al-Mahdi al-Muntazar fi Sahih al-Bukhari, and then he starts mentioning a hadith. First hadith he mentions, Hadith Umm Salama. And look at the reference, Rawahu Abu Dawood. He says, Abu Dawood has narrated this. Okay. Second hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. He says, Akhrajahu al-Hakim. Al-Hakim has narrated it, and Al-Zahabi has agreed with him. Third hadith of Jabir. He says, this has been narrated by Al-Harith ibn Abi Usama in his Musnad. Uh, as has been mentioned by Ibn al-Qayyim in al-Manar al-Munif. And then he goes on to mention other ahadith Mawlana, uh, for example, another one which is mentioned by Abu Dawood. Not a single narration from Sahih al-Bukhari Mawlana. And the article's name is Al-Mahdi al-Muntazar fi Sahih al-Bukhari. Yani he does not even mention the, the, the one narration in al-Bukhari which some commentators say may be interpreted. It does not have the Mahdi is not mentioned in it, but there is an unnamed leader that is mentioned in it, which it may be interpreted to refer to the Mahdi. But the Hadith, the text itself, is not referring to the Mahdi. So that Hadith is right here and he also presented it. But the, the really halal comedy part for us was actually checking out this article that he presents from the member telling the people there is a whole article yes there is a whole article Mawlana but it does not present a single narration from Bukhari and if you doubt this and also from Muslim it does not present any narration with reference so all you have is an article that has the heading Bukhari the, the word Sahih al-Bukhari in this entire article okay appears in the heading okay and it appears as a claim, but he does not give you any hadith from Bukhari. He does not give you any reference from Bukhari. And I'm 100% sure if this speaker would have read this article before presenting it, I think he was maybe in a, in a hurry, he didn't get the time, he would not present it because this is a joke. You're writing an article. I, I myself was wondering who is, and this is why, you see, this is the other problem with the internet, is that you should not trust websites. You can't just go on the internet and any website that opens up, you just trust it, okay? There are some trusted websites and there are some websites that are being run by amateurs, complete amateurs. And if you see a website where they're not giving you proper references, then you have to be aware, you have to understand that this website could be very well fooling you. And so, after that, even when he mentions Sahih al-Bukhari, he mentions from a tertiary, from a secondary source, he meant he's probably reading from some article. This is another problem with these Ahlul Bayt. They don't have this habit of checking the actual sources. Even when he quotes from Bukhari, he does not uh, quote from Bukhari directly. Rather, he quotes from a secondary source. How do we know that? Because the the source he's quoting from says, "And Bukhari said." So Bukhari would not say about himself that Bukhari said. That's how we know he's not quoting from Bukhari itself, but rather from a second resource. Now let's look at the narration that he brings. The question that now at this point many of you would be asking is that if all of these scholars, so now we, we are confused now, some of you might be saying, this speaker from the authority of the mimbar, you know, this is how he speaks when he sits on the member. He says, I'm sitting on the member of the Prophet and on the authority of this member, I'm telling you whatever I'm telling you. 
So then the question is, he's telling us from the authority of the member that the Mahdi is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim. Whereas the scholars, the great scholars and experts of Hadith, and some of these experts are people who have written entire studies, entire books, like Sheikh Adda Mahmoud al-Hamsh has a 500, more than 550 page book on the Mahdi itself. Similarly, there is another book, Al-Mahdi al-Muntazar fi daw al-Ahadith wa al-Athar al-Sahiha wa aqwal al-Ulama'i wa ara al-Firaq al-Mukhtalifa. This is by Dr. Abdul Alim Abdul Azim al-Bastawi. He has also uh, written on this topic, on Al-Mahdi al-Muntazar in the Sunni sources. And he talks about, on page uh, 359, he talks about Awamil al-Inkar, the causes behind those who reject this concept. And then on page uh, 362, he mentions the arguments of the rejectors. And the very first argument, the heading that he puts is, Ahadithul Mahdi lam yukharrijhum al-Bukhari wa Muslim. He says the first argument that these people present is that the Ahadith of Mahdi are not presented by Bukhari and Muslim. So the question comes, Sayyidina, who do we trust? This uh, mullah or this speaker is sitting on the mimbar. And from the authority of the member, he's saying, no, the narration is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim, the narration about Mahdi. And Mahdi is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim. Whereas these great scholars who are experts in Sunni hadith, they are denying it. So who do we trust? So I would say that you trust the expert. In this case, you study the one who you trust the one. You, you do your own research and, and look at the sources. What is his source? His source is basically an article, a web page, an unauthorized, unrecognized web page on the internet that has a heading that looks like the article is going to give you a hadith about the Mahdi or a hadith that mentioned the Mahdi from Sahih al-Bukhari. But when you read the article, he's presenting you narrations from Sunan Abi Dawood and narrations from Al-Hakim and, and from other compilations. He's presenting you narrations from every book other than Sahih al-Bukhari. So this is his source. Whereas these scholars, they have actually done extensive studies. And you shouldn't be so surprised when you... So you'll say, Sayyidina, so he was basically lying. And he basically got the whole thing wrong. So I'll say, well, you shouldn't be surprised if you listen carefully to these kinds of speakers who sit on the mimbar. Unfortunately, their level of knowledge and ilm is very shallow. Yani, and that is why I feel they don't have proper knowledge of their own books. So how can you trust them when they speak about other books? And, and even when they speak about other books, one of the things that I found really surprising, and that was another instance of halal comedy, was this uh, segment where he was talking about this narrator whom he refers to as Juzair ibn Uthman. So you see in one segment, he's talking about this narrator and he says Juzair ibn Uthman and Juzair ibn Uthman and Juzair ibn Uthman. Even when I was listening to that, I'm wondering which narrator is this that he's talking about? What narrator is this that even we've never heard of before? He says, no, no, it's, 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 he's a narrator and he's a Nasibi and like Juzair ibn Uthman. So for a moment, he even had me. I was, I was impressed. I was like, man, Juzair ibn Uthman. Either my ilm al-rijal is becoming very rusty or this speaker has very deep pockets in ilm al-rijal, man. I was about to note down that name to, you know, basically go and <laughs> recheck my encyclopedias of Rijal for this uh, new narrator that apparently he seems to have discovered. Juzair ibn Uthman, Juzair ibn Uthman, he's saying. And then he started mentioning the characteristics. So he said he was a Nasibi. And he used to curse Amir al-Mu'mineen after his salah, yani like ta'qibat wal billah. The way people have supplications, yeah, part of his supplication after salah was to curse Amir al-Mu'mineen. And then he mentions that this Juzair ibn Uthman was the same one who distorted the famous hadith of the Prophet وسلم, which is known as Hadith al-Manzila in which he addresses Amir al-Mu'mineen and he says, Ya Ali, anta minni bi manzilati Harun min Musa. O oh, Ali, you are like to me. As Harun was to Musa, this uh, narrator, he distorted it and he lied against Rasulullah and said that Rasulullah did not actually say Bimanzilati Haruna min Musa, rather he said Bimanzilati Qaruna min Musa. So he says Juzair ibn Uthman is the one 
who distorted this hadith and from Harun, he turned it into Qarun wal Billah. When he said that, I was like, oh boy. He's talking about Hariz ibn Uthman. Not Juzair ibn Uthman. Juzair ibn Uthman, no such character or narrator exists. He cannot even pronounce the name of a narrator from among the narrators of Bukhari correctly. He's saying Juzair ibn Uthman, Juzair ibn Uthman, whereas the narrator is Hariz, not even Hurayz. Some people mispronounce it Hurayz. No, it's Hariz ibn Uthman, a well-known Nasibi. So a person who cannot even pronounce the, the name of a narrator from Bukhari correctly, you want to trust him and take his fake web page as a source, that is your choice. But you see, we are preparing, when we discuss these topics with our students in our advanced study circle, and we cannot afford to make mistakes like this, and we cannot afford to fool them or to deceive them by telling them things like, you know, the Mahdi is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, because we know our students then, when they go and engage with people from other traditions, we don't want that they should be humiliated and that they should be disgraced. So that's why we share authentic and verified research. And that's why when we're talking about the summarized rejectionist view, the reason why we present this argument is not only because a number of leading Sunni scholars have made it, the argument that it is that a hadith about Mahdi are not found in Bukhari and Muslim, but because it is also factually correct. Now, what do they mean when they say that the hadith of Mahdi are not mentioned in Bukhari Muslim? Let it, look at, let's look at the narration that he tried to bring uh, in support of this. This is uh, Sahih al-Bukhari uh, in the as far as the international numbering is concerned. It's narration 3449. Okay, so this is in, uh, in volume 4, uh, book 55, hadith number 658. Uh, or if you go by the Arabic version of Dar ibn Kathir, it's on page 855. So here you have the hadith of Abu Huraira, who says, قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كَيْفَ أَنْتُمْ إِذَا نَزَلَ ابْنُ مَرْيَمَ وَفِيكُمْ وَإِمَامُكُمْ مِنْكُمْ How are you going to be? Abu Huraira claims, the Holy Prophet said, How are you going to be when the son of Maryam descends among you and your leader is amongst you. So he, he's trying to say that this hadith uh, mentions the Mahdi. But anyone who looks at the text of this hadith, it is clear there is no mention of the Mahdi in this book. So basically what those scholars are saying, they're not talking about a, what, what are called a hadith mujmala. When scholars like Sheikh Rashid Rida, Ahmad Amin, uh, Sa'ad Hassan, huh? Ibn Khaldun, uh, Sheikh Adab, uh, Mahmoud al hamsh and all of these scholars. And even when uh, a scholar like, for example, a Dr. Abdul Alim, Abdul Azim al-Bastawi, all these great scholars uh, like him who have actually written books on, on the Mahdi, when they say that the Mahdi has not been mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, they mean he has not been mentioned بعنوان al-Mahdi. Yani the word Mahdi has not appeared. They don't deny the existence of narrations in which you have unnamed or unknown entities being mentioned and then commentators are speculating that this may perhaps be an indirect reference to the Mahdi. They're not talking about veiled references or indirect, uh, you know, zanniyu dalala nusus. No, they want, they're talking about qat'iyu dalala nas. What they mean to say is that when they say there is no mention of the Mahdi in Bukhari and Muslim, they mean no explicit mention of, of Mahdi in Bukhari and Muslim. And that is absolutely true. Even the hadith of Muslim which uh, is presented, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي يقاتلون على الحق ظاهرين إلى يوم القيامة قال فينزل عيسى بن مريم صلى الله عليه وسلم فيقول أميرهم تعال صلي لنا فيقول لا إن بعضكم على بعض أمراء تكرمة الله هذه الأمة so this is uh, hadith number 156 from Sahih Muslim. The Prophet says a section of my people will not cease fighting for the truth and will remain, they will prevail until the day of resurrection. And then he said Jesus son of Mary would then descend and their, Mus their commander, the commander of the Muslims would invite him to come and lead them in prayer. But he would say no, some amongst you are commanders or some amongst you, this is the honor of Allah for this ummah. So 
the scholars who reject, they say there is no mention of the Mahdi in this in this hadith. All it talks about is the descent of Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam, and then there is a commander of the Muslims. From where did you get that this commander is the Mahdi? They ask. Similarly, the hadith of Bukhari, the same argument. They say there will be a leader at that time. So yes, who, who told you that leader will be Mahdi? That is the argument of the rejectionists. Now, there are traditionalist scholars among the Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah who respond to this argument and they say, well, you know, Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim never said that we are collecting and compiling all of the Sahih narrations. So that if a Sahih narration does not exist in Bukhari and Muslim, you should just dismiss it because it is not there in Bukhari and Muslim. No scholar says that, right? So they say for you to insist that it must be in Bukhari and Muslim, this is being overstrict. So this is the response also of the traditional Sunni scholars who do accept the claim about the Mahdi. But to summarize the point about this lie and this false claim that he's trying to make about us, we, we would say, first of all, the first big lie that he promotes about us is that we are the ones making this claim. I hope through this lecture it has become clear this is not our position. Aslan, we did not go into the uh, Sunni sources to prove the Mahdi so that we should then have to uh, deal with the criticisms against those narrations, right? So this is the claim of the revisionist Sunni scholars and critics of Hadith, such as Al-Allama, Sayyid al-Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida al husseini and then uh, scholars like, for example, uh, Al-Sheikh uh, Adab Mahmoud Al-Hamsh and others whose uh, names and books we have also referred to. So this is number one, their claim, not ours. So for him to call us a liar or to say that we're promoting blatant and flagrant lies is itself a lie which he needs to be questioned about and which he will be answerable for. Number one. Number two, the claim that this is a lie, this claim that uh, the ahadith of Mahdi or the Mahdi is not mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, to claim that this is a lie is itself a lie because as we mentioned that the scholars who have said this are actually correct. There is no clear explicit nas and there is no mention of Mahdi in these in the narrations of Bukhari and Muslim. But there is mention of Mahdi in Sunan Abi Dawood and Ibn Majah and these other books but the critics of Hadith such as Sheikh Adda Mahmud Al-Hamsh they actually then go on to say that these narrations which do explicitly mention the Mahdi, they are not reliable and they're not authentic. And that's why there is an interesting uh, principle after conducting this exhaustive study in over 550 pages. He looks at all, all the narrations he could assemble about the Mahdi in Shia sources, in Sunni sources. After assembling all of them together, here is what he has to write on, uh, this is the conclusion that he gives towards the end of the book. He gives it in the form of a formula or a principle, page 531. He says, So this is the conclusion that he arrives at. He says all the narrations which have appeared in the sources in which the Mahdi has been clearly and explicitly mentioned sahih. Those narrations turn out to be inauthentic when you examine their chains. And as for the narrations which are claimed to be about the Mahdi such as the one in Bukhari or Muslim by some scholars he says when you, and which are actually Sahih and authentic uh, by his standards, such as the one in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, فَغَيْرُ sarih. He says the problem with those narrations is that they don't mention the Mahdi clearly and explicitly. So he's dividing the narrations about the Mahdi in the books and the sources into two categories. One is Sahih and one is not Sahih, right? He says the one which is Sahih the ones which are Sahih, they don't have explicit mention of the Mahdi. So, we cannot use them to prove the Mahdi. He says the 
narrations in which the Mahdi has been mentioned explicitly, they are غير صحيح. They are not authentic. They are not reliable. So we cannot use them to prove anything. So the ones which are explicit are not authentic. The ones which are authentic are not explicit. This is, this is the problem with the narrations of the Mahdi in the Sunni sources. So his conclusion is that the Mahdi cannot be proven from the Sunni sources. This is his claim. But in any case, as I leave you and as we end this lecture, inshallah, if we have the opportunity, we will also discuss the Shia sources and the claim about Tawatur in the Shia sources. But as I leave you, I also want to give you a thought experiment with which you can expose the hoax that this uh, particular speaker was trying to sell on the authority of the member. <clears throat> you can do a very simple thought experiment. Uh, for those of you who have access to the speaker himself, you could probably do it with him. And you could actually <clears throat> show him the atrocious nature of the duplicity and dishonesty that he is perpetrating. So you can go to him or to any Mawlana and ask him, Sheikhana or Mawlana, is Alexander the Great mentioned in the Quran? So you ask him this question. If he's even a little bit learned and he, he has even a, a good grasp of the Quran, he will tell you clearly, Alexander the Great is not mentioned in the Quran. No self-respecting Muslim scholar will say that Alexander the Great is mentioned in the Quran. As soon as he says that, you bring out this. This is the Quran, text and translation and commentary by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Okay, this is uh, the Good Word edition. <clears throat> it's first published in 1934, but this is a Good Word reprint of 2013. You go to page 760, or whatever edition that you have, just go to the end of Surah Al-Kahf, chapter 18. You will see Appendix 7. Who was Zul Qarnayn? When he starts answering this question, Abdullah Yusuf Ali mentions if we accept the popular identification of Zul Qarnayn with Alexander. So he mentions Alexander the Great. So you can open this page on the, of the Quran, uh, the Yusuf Ali edition, and tell him, Mawlana, you just lied to me. You said Alexander the Great is not mentioned in the Quran. But here is the Quran. Here is page 760 and look clearly Alexander the Great is mentioned. So you are a liar and you are dishonest and you are promoting flagrant and blatant lies about the Quran. Not only is he mentioned on this page, in fact, in the active commentary here, if you look at footnote uh, 2430, Abdullah Yusuf Ali numbers his Footnotes, the footnote which he puts in commentary of verse 86. In this footnote also, he says, if Zulqarnain is Alexander the Great. So he mentions Alexander the Great. So the fact that Alexander the Great's name has been mentioned in this edition of the Quran, does it mean the Mawlanas who say, or the scholars who say Alexander the Great is not mentioned in the Quran, can you use this to say they are liars and they're promoting flagrant lies and blatant lies? And say, Baba, when we say Alexander the Great is not mentioned in the Quran, we mean in the text. Don't bring me commentaries. Commentaries, matos, anything can be mentioned. And the commentary is presenting you one view. This is not the this is not gospel truth. This view of Abdullah Yusuf Ali is rejected by other scholars. For example, even within the, the Shias, you have Mawlana uh, al marhum uh, Sayyid Sa'id Akhtar Razawi, he was asked uh, in his book, there is a booklet, Your Questions Answered, Volume 3, uh, I believe it is question 28, in which he's asked about this, uh, the question about Gog and Magog, right? It's either question uh, 28 or 29 or... Yeah, the question about Gog and Magog, it is there. And in that, he actually, he says, no, this is a pagan concept. The, uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, Alexander the Great was a pagan. And Zul Qarnayn is a Muslim. He is a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you cannot confuse and equate the two. So, according to him, 
Alexander the Great is not mentioned in the Quran. So if you were to go with him with, with a copy of the Yusuf Ali translation and say, well, Mawlana, you are a liar because Alexander the Great is mentioned. He will tell you, Baba, he's not mentioned in the text of the Quran. If a commentator is mentioning and that too, as per his view, then that is not hujja on the rest of us who do not agree with this view. You understand? So this is the same comedy that he perpetrated and enacted from the member, which is to say that those scholars, he thought it is us, but it's actually not us, it's the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah al-Jama'ah who are saying that Mahdi is not mentioned in the Bukhari Muslim, he's trying to imply that they are liars, when in reality they are not liars. Because the text of Bukhari and Muslim does not have any mention of Mahdi in it. Clear, explicit, explicit mention of Mahdi cannot be found in it. Rather, there is mention of an unknown, an unnamed figure whom some commentators are interpreting as Mahdi and others are denying. They're saying, no, this is just, this could be any Muslim military commander who would be alive at that time. So this is also Sheikh Adda Mahmoud al-Hamsh. This is also what he says is that what some traditional Sunni scholars have done is that they have taken weak narrations about the Mahdi, which mentioned the Mahdi explicitly, and in light of those weak narrations, they have tried to argue that this Sahih narration must also be talking about the same Mahdi that those weak narrations are talking about. But he says, Aslan, because those narrations are weak, you cannot use them to fill in the blanks in a narration which is Sahih. Because if you want to fill in the blank in a Sahih narration, you can only use a Sahih narration to fill that blank. If you have the eighth narrations, you cannot use that. That is the, the claim and the research based view of Al-Allama al-Sheikh Adda Mahmoud al-Hamsh, who is an expert of hadith, a professor of hadith, at, uh, and has taught uh, this ilm al-hadith at numerous universities. So I hope you understand the kind of gimmicks and the kind of stunts these people pull off from the mimbar. Well, you can give them a dose of their own medicine by doing a thought experiment of the same kind. Ask them if Alexander the Great is mentioned in the Quran. Of course, they will say no. If they say yes, then that means <laughs> their level of ignorance is even higher. And you can challenge them to show you where is Al-Iskandar Al-Azam. The word Iskandar Al-Azam does not appear anywhere in the Quranic text. The fact that it appears in the commentary and someone has tried to interpret Zulqarnain to mean that one possible meaning or one hypothesis could be that it is Zulqarnain does not give you the right to say that Alexander the Great has been mentioned in the Quran. Rather, if you are, if you want to be truthful with your people, you should tell them Alexander the Great is not mentioned in the Quran. But yes, there is mention of Zulqarnain in the Quran and some have interpreted Zulqarnain to mean that it could possibly refer to Alexander the Great. But this is not the strong view and it has been rejected and refuted by more than one Muslim scholar. Same thing when it comes to the view about the Mahdi not being there, not being mentioned in the Hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. When we teach our advanced level students, this is what we tell them. We tell them that, yes, according to the rejectionists, this, this is the claim that they make. And they say that, you know, Bukhari and Muslim usually, they have a bab on the descent of Isa ibn Maryam. But they don't have any, normally when Bukhari and Muslim have numerous narrations, because the claim is that the narrations about this were mutawatir from the time of Rasulullah. So they say if they are mutawatir, Bukhari and Muslim do not leave out, would not be expected to leave out a mutawatir narration. Rather, when they have even, you know, a good number of narrations about a topic, they set up a whole bab on it. But the fact that there is no bab on the Mahdi, and not only there is no bab on the Mahdi, but not, not even a single uh, narration in which the Mahdi is mentioned. So they say this creates great doubt. And, uh, you know, within Sunni circles, Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim are given precedence. They have a very high station. Some Sunni and Salafi scholars are obsessed with Bukhari and Muslim. They want to reduce all truth and all authentic ahadith to these two books. So they're very strict in this. And that's why for them, the hadith of Mahdi not appearing in these two most reliable of and most authoritative compilations, it then gives them reason and cause to doubt the whole narrative. So in any case, this is basically their position. This is the rejectionist view. Among the Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'a, there is another camp with another list of scholars who do affirm the concept of the Mahdi. But the latest cutting edge researches that have come out 
among the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, particularly this study by Dr. Adda Mahmoud al Hamsh and uh, these other studies, they have uh, reversed the picture and they have actually uh, discredited this concept. And actually, a Sheikh uh, Adda Mahmoud al Hamshi actually even goes on to say uh, on page uh, 533, he denies the tawatur of these narrations and he says, Ar-riwayat allati tanussu ala ala ismi al-mahdi wa ismi abi wa annahu min muldi fa'atima hasaniyun aw husayniyun kulluha munkaratun aw wahiyatun aw da'ifatun This is all the riwayat which clearly mention the name of the Mahdi and the name of his father and that he will be from the children of Fatima whether he's Hassani or Husayni all of these riwayat are munkara they are unreliable, wahiya they are strange, unreliable due to their strangeness they are wahiya, they are flimsy, aw da'ifa or they are weak وَلَمْ تَصِحْ مِنْهَا أَيْ رِوَايَةً And he says not one riwayah among these is sahiha. And that is why he then goes on in his conclusion, uh, point number 11 of his conclusions on page 538, he then gives a very important advice to the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah because some of the Salafis and Wahhabis are very strict. They say if you reject any hadith uh, which uh, has uh, sahih chains or which has been authenticated by even some of their scholars, they then uh, label the rejecter of such a hadith or such a concept to be a deviant or a dal, mudil, mubtadi, things like that. But he says, no, you don't have any sahih hadith about this. So therefore, he appeals to the Ahlul Sunnah not to attack uh, the Zaydiyya and the Ibadiyya because these are two Muslim sects within the Muslim Ummah. The Zaydiyya are actually Shia and the Ibadiyya also in Oman and they also don't accept Mahdi because they have not received any, um, they don't accept the concept of the, of the Mahdi. And that is why he says that you should not attack them. And he says you should also not attack or criticize or condemn uh, the scholars of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the free thinkers among the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and also the revisionist scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah who have rejected the concept of the Mahdi after discovering that the narrations about it are unreliable. So for example, even Al-Allama al-Sheikh Muhammad Muhiddin Abdul Hamid, who was among the <coughs> scholars of Al-Azhar and an editor of many important books of uh, the Islamic sciences, he also writes in one of his footnotes, he says that the latest studies that are coming out um, on Sunni narrations about the Mahdi he says the latest studies are showing that uh, the ahadith about the Mahdi are actually Israeliyat. So there is this claim that there was a group of converts from Judeo-Christian background. When they entered Islam very early on, they brought their baggage into Islam. And so all those narrations and all those claims that they then invented or fabricated in order to support their past baggage or beliefs and practices that they used to believe in when they were Jews and Christians. All the narrations that they invented or circulated, they come under Israeliyat. And so the scholars uh, or the latest studies that are coming out on the subject of the Mahdi are making this argument that when we trace the chains, when we study these individual chains, uh, <clears throat> they connect to the Israeliyat. Now, this claim has been disputed, for example, at Dr. Abdul Alim Abdul Azim al Bastawi, whose uh, study we mentioned, he has written a book entitled Al Mahdi al Muntadar, Fi Daw al Ahadith wal Athar al Sahiha wa Aqwal al Ulama wa Ara al Firaq al Muftalifa. This is a master's dissertation that he has pub published. And in this book, he tries to argue that the narrations about the Mahdi in Sunni books are, in fact, reliable. And so he dismisses the claim that it is Israeliyat because he says that we don't really see the Israeli narrators except in a few narrations. And he also tries to respond to many other shubuhat. But then a Sheikh Adab Mahmoud al Hamsh, he also has gone through this book and he responds to uh, the analysis and the claims of a Dr. Abdul Alim Abdul Azim al Bastawi in his. In his study, critical study of the narrations about the Mahdi. So, in summary, we can say that both of these camps exist within the Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah from the time of uh, Ibn Khaldun all the way 
uh, up to a later period, in fact, even before Ibn Khaldun, there are reported instances of uh, Sunni scholars actually discrediting these narrations and not relying upon them. Uh, you have that camp, and on the other hand, you have also have a camp, a list of Sunni scholars, a imma of hadith, who have authenticated these narrations using Rijali methodologies, which are based on uh, certain maneuvers which the more strict scholars of Rijal and Hadith from the Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah such as Sheikh Adda Mahmud Al-Hamsh do not approve of and do not accept. So ultimately it comes down to what kind of Rijali uh, methodology is followed and that's why uh, even uh, Sheikh Adda Mahmud Al-Hamsh he does not completely deny and rule out the possibility. He says if we go by the Sahih narrations he says the most you can say is that it is possible because we don't have uh, a proof for this so he says the most you can say is that it is possible there is a possibility he does not deny the possibility in the future that a person from the Ahlul Bayt he says but this person should not be connected to the Mahdi he should not be connected to all of those narrations the weak and discredited narrations but rather he says just stick to the Sahih narrations the Sahih narrations are saying in the Sunni books that there is going to be someone from the Ahlul Bayt, from the progeny of the Prophet, there is going to rise a just ruler who will establish justice and campaign against evil and oppression, and that's it. God will send barakat and uh, the earth will become a better place uh, during his period of rule. He says, if you just stick to this much, because he's, he's a very strict scholar, he does not want to bring da'if ahadith to fill in the blanks. Because when you accept this Sahih Hadith, then the question is, tell us more about this person. What do the Ahadith, are there any other details about this person that the Ahadith give us? He says, unfortunately, in our Sunni books, and even in the, the Shia books, he, he has done a full study of the Shia Ahadith as well. He says the Shia Ahadith and the Sunni Ahadith, uh, because of their weakness, they do not uh, suffice to fill in the blanks uh, about who this person will be and what the details are. So that's why he ends by saying that he does not deny the possibility completely that a person from the Ahlul Bayt, a, a ruler <clears throat> from the Ahlul Bayt may rise and establish a government which will call towards justice and eliminate oppression and that there will be prosperity in his time. And he says, according to the, those narrations, he might rule for five years or for seven years. He says this prophecy as a prophecy he says we can leave it at that, but he says you cannot make it part of Aqidah, you cannot call those people who deny it or who reject it because of their, their Rijali methodology. You cannot call them deviant, you cannot uh, attack them or condemn them or basically vilify them. So he's tried to present a more moderate and neutral position in his book as well. And there are a lot of very useful things that he has mentioned in his book, as well as Dr. Abdul. Uh, Al Bestawi. These are good books. We would recommend those people who know Arabic and who want to go deeper into the subject. You can definitely <clears throat> benefit from these researches and read these books in full to get a sense and idea of what kind of voices and what kind of ideas and arguments exist with regard to the Mahdi when it comes to the Sunni sources and the Sunni scholars. Assalamu alaikum. جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. Thank you for watching. Please consider subscribing. Also click the bell icon and choose the all option to get notified for upcoming videos automatically.